my name's Ian Austin, and this is Friday Night Shudder. Hang on to night's edition, Friday Night Shudder. I am covering Black Lake Episode 1 and Black Lake Episode 2, and they're coming up right about now. We open on a Shudder exclusive appearing on screen. Awesome. I'm really pumped for this because I haven't watched much Shudder exclusive stuff and feel like for the sake of podcast, I should start doing it because I'm sure they have lots of amazing stuff on there and this is first attempt to really get into it. Because if you're not going to watch exclusive stuff on streaming service, honestly, what's the point? So we get text on screen, crime scene, Fort Sun, ski resort, 25th January 1996. And I immediately think this is a procedural, and I'm very happy with that, so I love procedurals. At the moment, one of my favourite TV shows, it's not currently on, but it was on, is um, the Netflix, not Netflix, Handball Letton TV series, because it's on Netflix, will be episodes. Watched a few back in the day, but I'm really getting into it now. And if Shudrev put Handball on their service, that's the first thing I'm going to watch. We see a creepy corridor, and a bearded man's led down it in handcuffs. I'm calling it, he's the murderer. A plainclothes cop side-eyes him. A man in a Disney-style raincoat opens the door as another man records Dr. Beardman. Mr. Cop puts a comforting hand on Dr. Beardman's shoulder. They descend the staircase. Dr. Beardman hears voices, but is promptly ignored as they continue descending to the murder basement. Dr. Beardman's cuffs are removed for some reason, and he leads them... The, there by them I mean police officers over to a wall. Then Dr. Beardman wonders where they are. Who you ask? I'm assuming people who murdered or people who left there. Anyway, he starts to freak out when no one answers his questions, grabs a wrench and bashes in Mr. Cop's knee. Miss Dr. Beardman flees as two cops pursue. The cameraman falls over for some reason, accidentally getting the perfect angle of the escape. Mr. Cop sees something. Q opening credits of a snowy apocalyptic wasteland, or, you know, Sweden. They're intense and very operatic. My hope is that this is Unto Dawn-esque. I really love Unto Dawn. It's one of my favourite games of recent memory. Not, I think a lot of people like playing games and getting immersed in the story. I like playing games feel I can channel and change the story, because sometimes I like think I can do a better job than people make it, and like having the options to go my way, rather than necessarily the way they prefer me to go. You make choose your own adventure stuff and then the player feels like they're impacting the story. Anyway, so we get more text on the screen. Stockholm, 25th January 2016. A woman's on pier watching water. She's joined by another woman in a hat. A concerned woman at that. That's a pun. Beep, beep goes a car. Two men emerge. Also concerned for woman, woman number one. I think we're going to need some names soon. So I'm getting very confused already. We get one name, the first woman, second, no, second woman's called Met, and the smaller guy's called Lippy. He assists, fuck it, I'm going to make, start make up names, he assists Guy with bags. Another cop pulls up, another car pulls up, not enough cop, and we meet Frank. And with Frank are three women, one he's dating or his own just start dating. To recap, recap, in 1996 we met Dr. Beardman and Mr. Cop. In 2016 we've met Met, Lippy, Guy, Frank, his state Jesson, and two random women, and of course the lead female. I'm guessing her name's Hanny from descriptions on Shudder's website and on the app. I think this show's going to be a fucking bloodbath by the way. There's way too many characters and I can't, with only eight episodes, I can't see men for them making it in a very long time. The assorted sweets shake hands. Oh, and we can add Oswald to that list. He's clearly New Franklin. And if you don't know who Franklin is, watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He's the most annoying character in the history of slash movies. Frank is told off regarding Jesson. And he's asked, can she even ski? Who gives a shit? Lippy and Met discuss how much of a man whore Frank is. While in background, Hangy looks very p- pensive. We get some scenery porn. Hanny lucid, scr- lucid dreams about baby yelling her name. We get some more scenery porn. Hanny can't get reception on her phone. Lip is scared they may have wound up in Norway, but his fears are quickly elevated when they find the ski lodge. 
Once again, Hannah is pensive. I think this actress has one frame reference, and that's to be pensive. But I also said that about Juliet on Lost, and by the end, she, Elizabeth Mitchell is one of my favourite actors on the programme. So sometimes it is literally just an acting choice. Anyway, we get the reveal that Frank has a satellite phone, which destroys one of those annoying tropes about save phone and mobile phone steps not working, because satellite phones should really always work. It turns out no one has a key for the ski lodge. Fantastic. Luckily, the doors are already open. No one seems very concerned about this. Oswald wonders how Johan can afford this place, and I start to wonder who the fuck is Johan? Is that mystery that's going to pair from the future? Uh, gang fuck about trying to find the light switch. Someone says hello a lot, another annoying trope. I don't mind tropes in general. I don't like the say hello in a scary haunted place thing. Because if someone is there, they're going to follow your voice and murder you. Anyway, I guess they're looking for Johan. Hung Lee finds paper from 1996 discussing two stories. One, the shit that went down in the prologue. And two, the story of Parallax Hal Jordan sacrificing his life to stop a sun eater from destroying Earth. Anyway, Honey finds a man with a torch. Frank trots up, asking if the man is Eriki. I think I need a fucking white boy for this. Frank and Honey praise the place as Eriki shows them to their rooms. Also, Eriki doesn't have a phone. Foreshadowing. It's not, it's not Frank, it's Guy. Guy says, but I have your number. And Eriki says that sort and then walks off. Okay then, sure, why not? Honey, expl Honey explores her room. Later on, she sips water and removes her hairband. We cut Frank and Jessen having some anal against the wall. Jessen pushes her him onto the bed. Missionary position ensues. In the next room, Honey gets in bed with Guy, who's reading John Grisham's novelization of Rose Leslie's Honeymoon. Guy seems quite horny, but Honey would rather just go to sleep. Later on, Honey wakes up. That's going to happen a lot, by the way. Oh, and we discover the guy is Johan. That's good. They're paying off mysteries quite fast. No, it's only eight episodes. Don't want to dread shit out. Honey goes exploring. That's nothing which is going to happen a lot. Lights flicker in the hallway. She goes back to bed. We get a creepy shot of the door, which I believe is the door leading to the murder basement. Jump scare number one. A snowplow is driven through frame by Eriki. I'm getting really weird vibes from Mary Key, by the way. Our gang are at breakfast. It turns out Oswald cooked, and he seems like quite a good cook. He cooked a full breakfast for everyone. He had a lot of pictures taken of everyone. And then we get a great scene where they slut shame a yawn and Jessen by making bestiality illusions. Apparently she's a wild animal. I thought Frank was a slut. Anyway, Honey insists that she heard thumping the previous evening, and F1 jokes that it must have been Jessen. Honey insists that she heard thumping and it was not pounding. Met us if the nightmares are back. They're not. It's cl I'm glad no nightmares aren't back. But also at the same time, I'm a bit concerned that they aren't back, you know? Because we have a Nightmare Christmas coming up soon. And it'd be nice to continue theme for nightmares. But I'm sure they'll come and play later on. Honey sees that a door isn't a door. It's a jar. You're welcome. She walks into a kid's bedroom. Why not? It's creepy with pictures slewn all over the place. Um, words formed out on the floor. They'll come in play later with building blocks. And what looks like fucking Cabbage Patch style dolls lying in chairs. Cabbage Patch or Garbage Pail Kids? I, I'd say made more Garbage Pail Kids because these ones look really fucked up. It looks like um, if you got Chucky doll, but it looked even more disturbing. I think I really want to get one of those Chucky dolls. Just stick it up somewhere as a valuable item. The gang prepares to go skiing. Honey sees Eriki. She asks him when the place closed originally, and Eriki tells her it never cl opened. At this point, alarm bells should be ringing for Honey because this guy is creepy as fuck. Eric he continues, now it especially wasn't open in 1996 and he's not going to discuss the matter further. Realising his error and that Honey is actually generally starting to investigate him, Eric he flees on a snow bike. I, I actually like this idea of Eric he knows everything about this place, 
But instead of lying to him and continuing conversation and playing dumb, he just flees. It's a really neat narrative trick because... You know, why would he stay and talk to them? He feels uncomfortable. He knows they'll get something out of him. He wants a wrong way. And also, I'm really doing this show so far. I think it's actually genuinely particularly entertaining. Will it be by the end of this little bit? I'm not sure. But right now, I'm really digging on what I'm watching. The gang goes skiing properly this time. And... I actually really like this scene. I, I think it's quite long, the bit where they go skiing, but it's very entertaining. And one thing I really like so far about the show is they're building character, but it's interesting. Like, there's a lot of dynamics here that they're not beating over the head with, but it's some quite cool stuff. Like, Lippy and Matt are together, Johan and Honig together, Frank and Jessen are together, you've got Ellen and Oswald in sort of the background, Oswald's the cook, Ellen hasn't really got much to do, and incidentally we won't actually find our name for a few minutes, I'm just trying to explain. And you've got all stuff with Ariki, and as we find out now, Oswald has a go at Ellen later on for fucking up slicing potatoes in the kitchen, there's a little bit of story there I'm sure, but I'm, I'm, I'm generally getting into this, I think it's good. Outside, we find two arseholes on snow bites, which is a trope I love. Two arseholes, two snow bites. These two arseholes discuss a plan while creeping on our gang through binoculars. Ooh, a bit of a twisting tale there. Who are these guys? What effect are they going to have on the plot? And also, why are they so close to this particular complex? They're not exactly far away. They're literally right outside using binoculars. Strange. Inside, everyone fakes joviality, and they discuss the idea of turning the lodge into a hotel. We find out that Johan wants to buy the lodge, or at least he's considering buying it. It's quite a cool twist. It points out how rich he is, but also creates a bit of fight between the other characters, because they don't all look rich, and all, some of them look like they're taking advantage of Johan. Incidentally, I'm drinking a dark Pepsi caffeine-free. My drink joys on Sunday. Johan tries to do a toast, but someone knocks, knocks, knocks on the front door. And it's the two arseholes from outside. Yay, they're really rushing through this shit. We find out their names are Dag and Justin. Dag and Justin. Fucking Dag and Justin. These are great names. These are not boring generic names. Maybe they are in Sweden, but I think it's kind of nice to have this. And also at the same time, I want to point out, if you do want to watch this, the... Language isn't a barrier particularly. There's a few bits where if you knew Swedish, you would find out a bit more information. But I think in some ways, by not knowing it, a few of the twists later on work better because you, I literally have no idea what the fuck the words mean. So it's like characters know more than I do. And one thing in fiction people say a lot is it's better if the audience gets hair of the characters. I think sometimes that's true, but enough times I like characters knowing stuff I don't, because of course they would. Like, they're not going to share everything. So, obviously, we find out that their names are Dag and Justine. Dag is a great name, by the way. And they invite themselves in like a couple of arseholes. But they also agree being a documentary. A documentary, a short documentary at that about Honey. Why not? It's just a bunch of people pointing the camera at her and asking her questions, which she deflects. Dag reveals that he rents a wood shop from Eriki. As Johan's rape alarm goes in supernova, and can you blame him? These guys really look sketchy as fuck. Hongi starts grilling Justin about Lodge's backstory, but he doesn't know fucking anything about it. I don't even think he lives in Zeri. He claims otherwise, but... Anyway, Dad says he has a mail order business and he broaches a merger with Johan. Johan, why would you not go in business with this creepy, sketchy as fuck guy who was peeping and creeping on you guys through binoculars from two metres away earlier? Johan considers the offer, but then says he thinks Dad would be a great addition to the ski lodge as a waiter. And that's quite douchey, Johan. Dad decides that it's the perfect time to show off his favourite knife. He points out how great it is and then how sharp it is by slamming it down into the table. Johan polite, 
not even politely smugly says he doesn't want the knife when Dag offers him to give it to him as as a gift. Justine starts getting very concerned and begs Dag not to murder any more teenagers as Dag gets up and starts asking why Johan doesn't want his knife and whether he thinks he's better than Johan. This scene gets very tense. Justine has to physically escort Dag towards the door as Dag keeps yelling for Johan to take the knife. I think he wants Johan to butt some bread. I'm getting the impression Dag's angry, but not in a murderous way necessarily. It's like his name last name is Dag Red Herring, you know? It's it's not it's just anger. He's angry, he's not gonna murder anyone. But that doesn't change anything because Johan doesn't want the knife at all. So Honey a soul situation by picking the knife up and giving it Dag's knife back. Dag sadly takes the knife and leaves. Everyone wonders silently why Joanne didn't just accept the knife and defuse the entire situation to start off with, but they don't get an answer. Later on, Oswald creeps outside Honey's room. So, change of pace. Johan inside is rationalising not taking the knife. Hongi asks Johan for some large bat story, but he denies everything, just like Eric later on. Luckily, he's saved by noises coming outside. And remembering previous evening where Frank and Jesson were having the anal against the wall, he snaps and starts accusing them. Jacuzzi. But noises are coming from a creepy door as they find out when they go in the hallway and find Frank and Jesson there. The noise stops suddenly. Hongi wants to investigate, but Johan accuses her of something. It's vague. Hongi lies that she's hungry and goes exploring. She walks through the kitchen and asks Oz about the paper from earlier, but he plays dumb, or maybe is dumb. It's kind of vague. Hongi sees the fridge magnet spelling out the same word as the blocks from earlier on. I'm paying off shit already. She's very concerned, but Oz plays dumb, or is dumb. In the room, Johan is tearing the newspaper apart. Holy shit. There's some messy messiness going on here, y'all. I think Johan can't be trusted. Maybe he's a fucking murderer. You'd think he's too young, but clearly they live in a supernatural universe. So maybe he's one of the 13 immortals. You know 13 immortals. Vandal Savage. Kendra Saunders. Tef Adam. Um, Razagul and a bunch of other fuckers. It's a DC comic. The next morning we see Jesson's eye is bloodshot. Oz accuses Lippy of giving her pink eye. Eww. Met nicely defines to us what sleep paralysis is. Then she says Jesson should go wash her disease covered hands. Holy shit. What the fuck? She phrases it as in she doesn't want anyone to get the infection, but you know, that's quite harsh. You know, and you should have covered hand safety at the orientation. We get some more scenery porn. You know, like showing off Sweden. It's a bit post less apocalyptic when it's not shot at night. Eric Key is in the hallway changing the light bulb. Honey walks up and inquires about the creepy door. Eric Key denies everything, but also refuses to open the door. He says there's nothing to worry about. But it is dangerous. Johan fumes and says, well, what the fuck do you expect us to do? And Eriki mentions earplugs. I, I, Eriki's my favourite character so far. Hongi asks him if they can call Yona. Eriki says the owner is dead, then realises he's faux pas and flees. Only Hongi finds that concerning. How is this not concerning to you guys? Johan, if there isn't an owner... This buying this property is a lot easier than you made out. You know? So on that aspect, you should be delighted. He doesn't seem to give a shit. He just seems to think, well, Eric, he's a gatekeeper. I don't know what to do. Holy Stone wants to like, what the fuck? The owner's dead. What? This doesn't make any sense. You know, it's great. It's a really awesome twist. But these ca- some of these characters aren't actually not human beings at this point. Holly goes back to the kids' room because why not? The blots have been put away neatly. She finds some creepy drawings that seem to have predicted Jesson's and Lippy's pink eye. We have premonition drawings, guys. This is really getting intense now. Sorry. 
Johan is on the phone with his dad, and it's a sad, tense conversation. So, of course, Frank in interrupts, wanting to set up a, a camera in the cellar, or by the cellar, rather. Frank has no sense of timing, by the way. Holly shows Matt the pink eye, photos, pink eye pictures, but Matt shrugs it off because not... Sorry, sorry Hongi shows Met the pink eye pictures, but Met shrugs it off because not everything drawn has happened yet. And she also writes Hongi no psychics would date with in 2014 when Queen of Hive used Dr. Het Hammond to hide Dr. Hector Hammond's consciousness inside Superman's head. Psy war, shout out y'all. She asks if Jacob's come back. Hongi says no. Met then asks if Hongi's taking her pills. We've seen that she has. Hongi says yes. We discovered that they're sisters, and that's really nice. I like that. That's a cool thing, because you don't have to beat us over head with it. You don't have to set up from the start they're sisters. Their actions suggested it, and then you've got a casual mention later on. This show's quite subtle of that. I like that. Outside, Joan gets really pissed off at Lippy. Not quite mentioning the pink eye thing, but really getting angry that there's snow all over his car. And I think, you're in the middle of a fucking snowy wasteland, you asshole. There's going to be snow in your car. Chill out. Then he says to Harley that he couldn't get through to his dad. He's a fucking liar. Johan's a liar. I won't stand for it. It's not cool. He's really, he's getting my nerves. Damn you, Johan. Johan feels he wants to go on a solo trip with Harley. The cellar camera catches Eric and Dad plotting. Dun, dun, dun. They walk off. Jessen emerges. She looks at the camera, the cellar camera, and then looks towards him and follows him. Next scene, Jessen's on her own in the kids' room. Her pink eye is really fucking gross at this point. Jessen sits down and ranges the blocks. She forms a word, and I have no idea what it is, so this is really tense and creepy and ambiguous. And I feel like it's going to pay off later on, but I love that Shudder has not added subtitles for what the words mean with blocks mean. Because it really adds a lot to this. Because now I'm wondering what the fuck's going on, what, she, what words did she sing, what context they have. But if you're a Swedish person, you know because you understand the Swedish language. So you gain something that rest us don't gain. Like for me, this is a mystery. For you, that's paying something off. But for me, it's going to pay off later on in a casual way. And it's going to have more meaning for me. Anyway, we get more scenery porn. Johan and Honey drink wine on mountaintop, which that sounds fucking lovely. I don't even like wine. I'd love to do that. Johan says that he'll own the forest too when he buys the lodge from, you know, the owner who's dead, which he doesn't seem concerned about. And then he proposes to Honey. We cut before she can answer. Lippin met singing, sitting in a hot tub, encouraging Jessen to take her eye drops. Oson Ellen drink beer in sauna. You know, I love this podcast sentences like that. Like two sentences back to back, which sum up how fucking weird the show is in a great way. Joanne and Honey emerge to reveal that they're engaged. Lots of cheers ensue. I assume some of them are fake. Ellie doesn't even try to cheer. She just turns around and grabs a robe and Iron Man walks off. She looks really sad. So I think maybe they're hinting that she loves Johan. Maybe she loves Honey. You, know, you don't know. Like... It's cool. Later on, no, no, not even later on, Holly opens a beer and hallucinates the swimming pool briefly. Hmm, that's quite cool. Foreshadowing. Later on, Holly sees Justine. Justine. He's assisting Eric, but reveals he did ask Dad what happened at Lodge 20 years ago. And Dad told him a whole family was dead. It may have been murder, it may not. Joanne emerges and gets jealous. And then later on explains that he had to lie to Hongi. For reasons. It's really terrible logic he uses. Hongi bemoans the lack of free wind that she had come. And then dumps her peers down the sink. Later on Hongi's woken by noises and investigates. A door won't open. But does when she walks away. She walks inside and sees something. But we cut to black. What the fuck? So before I get into the one time, the recap for episode two even, it's just mini review of episode one. I love 
that. That was fantastic. Genuinely, really, really enjoyed it. I thought it was tense. I thought maps, it was atmospheric. I thought there's lots of neat little character stuff. I really enjoyed the setting, the acting, the mysteries. Um, essentially, what's going on with Johan, what the nightmares Hanny's having are, who's Jacob, what the pills are for specifically, what mysteries regarding Jessen's pink eye. We know Lippy's actually got pink eye, but Jessen seems to be a cat more mystical. Who Dag and Justine are, who Eric is, how the previous owner died, how this connects to Dr. Beardman and Mr. Cop from the start of the one, how the 20 years go back story connects to this back story. And I know I've made a lot of DC comic book jokes. No, no I do, it's my thing. I love main comic book references, especially DC. But I, I really, really fucking like this first episode. And what I'm essentially going to do is I'm going to recap episode two, but I'm going to do it in a couple of days. I'm going to let this percolate a bit. So, essentially, this episode will be recorded over, like, two days. This is the Sunday part, and I'm going to be doing another part tomorrow or Thursday. But, yeah, I, I generally watching this. I, I've avoided the recap for the next episode, too, because I don't want to... The pre, the next week on, rather, because I don't want... No, I want going cold to this. But I genuinely... I think the nicest thing I'm saying is that with some show the stuff like Great Encounters, it's a slog to get through. But for this, I really want to watch the next episode. And I can't wait. I mean, I, I genuinely don't know what's going to happen. I got a really good vibe from this. And it's something which holds up to a bit of bit of analysis and recap in a way love stuff doesn't. But I think the flip side is that you only want to watch this sort of episode once and then one go into the next. So in that way, it's a bit different than the movie because movies you have to sort of Pause and stop and ruins momentum. So yeah, I bring on episode two. I fucking love this. And I really want to know what happens next. So yeah, you'll be hearing it instantly. But I'll be calling that in a few days. So hmm. yeah, I really fucking enjoyed that. I can't wait to see the next episode. Hello, this is f Futuring compared to the rest of the episode. Because I'm calling this on Thursday the 8th of November, and you'll have to ignore past him because he said that he was going to be reviewing, or our future him would be reviewing the second episode for this podcast of Black Lake, but I've had a really shitty day at work, and I really feel like it's a good time to just cut my losses and put out a shorter episode than usual, but also you can use some pragmatic logic of fact that if this is Shudder TV... A review of a short TV show. Why would the episode be as long as a normal episode? Some of you will probably think that's a cop out. Some of you will probably think that's okay. Personally, I'm not really bothered because I feel like I've said all I can about the first episode. I loved it. And anything I do on this Thursday from now on would be tinged with a bit of negativity. And I don't want to be negative for negativity's sake. I had a great time watching episode one and recapping it and reviewing it. And I think anything more I could say about episode two at this point, it's just not worth it. So I am going to play some Red Dead Redemption, eat some toast, and maybe watch some of the Hannibal TV show. I suggest you guys have a bodacious weekend. And I will be back next week with episode two. Because for the next eight weeks, it's one episode a week of Black Lake. A show that I actually really enjoyed and will continue enjoying. So, until next time, remember, life is beautiful. <laughs>